I'm here today with Ken Reese, and we are going to discuss Anna Kingsford. Now, Anna Kingsford was born Anna Bonus, um, but she later on married Algernon Kingsford, which is how she got the name Kingsford. She was born on the 16th of September 1846 in Essex and moved to Blackheath as a child, which is one of my favourite haunts of London, Blackheath, beautiful. Uh, she later on went and moved to Hastings. And it was there that in 1867 she discuss, discovered seances and spiritualism. And um, if I hand you over to Ken now, maybe you could explain a bit more about how she got into the work she did. Uh, yes, and, and, and thank you. Uh, do I address you as Debbie or Mrs. Elliot? Miss Elliot? Debbie's fine. Debbie's <laughs> fine. Right, well, Debbie um, started me off there, started this podcast off. Um, I... I I, I feel I need to, to say why I have a certain kind of vicarious identity with Anna um, before anything sort of academic or phil philosophical, theologically. Um, one is um, geographical reasons. Debbie's always already mentioned the link there with Black Heath. I don't have that link, but I do have a link with where Anna died and where her husband had his um, practice as a curate and I think he became a vicar didn't he eventually mm -hmm. Church of England that is that's in uh, Shropshire and I like Shropshire very much so there's a geographical link there there's also a geographical link um, as it happens with Hastings in a very limited degree um, secondly there's a health link because both Anna and I sort of suffered to suffer from the same respiratory conditions, asthma, pneumonia, as far as I know I haven't had TB um, but there's a certain empathy knowing what she must have been through having asthma all her life as I uh, have had. Um, uh, and the third aspect there is actually more a relationship to my mother. Um, Anna was very keen on anti-vivisectionism as my mother was uh, my mother very much liked dogs, as indeed I do, and um, I remember that Anna saw a boy hitting a dog at some point, somewhere in the um, memories of Anna by Edward Maitland. Uh, she's recorded as um, seeing this boy hitting a dog, and I thought it was great because she then proceeded to hit the boy, and she broke her parasol, and she asked Edward Maitland if she could have a stronger parasol. So I, I, that was rather fun. <laughs> um, so there's the whole anti-vivisectionism thing, which I, I have a feeling for as well, but not as much as my mother. Uh, Anna Kingsford was a poet. Um, I, I've seen a few of the, her poems. Uh, my mother was also a poet, and indeed my mother wrote nearly 300 poems, um, some of which have been published. Uh, um, my mother was extremely devout Christian to the point of mysticism and, and as um, I'll touch upon Anna Kingsford also considered herself a mystic and indeed proceeded to develop a method which she felt was actually very ancient to um, as it were um, present a Christianity mystically informed according to her. So. That, that, that's just a kind of introduction almost in a personal sense of why nowadays I feel um, linked to her in some way. Um, now the, the thing about Anna, she was a, a revolutionary of, of her time and, and many people would consider she was a feminist. Um, I first discovered her through um, a piece of writing she um, developed. Whether it was one of her illuminations or not, I'm not quite sure. I'm just trying to find it because today I have a file in front of me because um, the richness of her life is so great it's very hard for me to remember. Well, why are you looking for that? Oh, I've got it. Oh, got it. Um, the Prophecy of the Kingdom of the Soul. Now when I sort of um, read this in 2003, I was teaching a class at the time on the magical consciousness and I thought I'd throw in some female magicians because in many ways I still con I, I do consider Anna Kingsford also a magician as well as a mystic. Um, I came across this piece and I read it initially as a feminist tract and now realise in many ways it, it goes beyond feminism or it's not just a feminist tract. 
that she was really writing in terms of a, the certain kind of theology that uh, she developed, uh, the prophecy of the kingdom of the soul, the day of the woman. I mean, it sounds very feminist to me. So, um, basically, she, uh, as I say, was quite revolutionary, in my view, in being ahead of her time within, well, the suffragette move movement, she was involved in that, for people who are theosophists, uh, they will obviously know the name, the much more well-known of Annie Besant, and really Anna con converted Annie Besant to anti-vivisectionism, because before um, there was much interaction between them, Annie Besant was not an anti-vivisectionist at all, and um, later, not that much later, she became one. Um, Annie was also very keen on women's dress before dress reform uh, for people interested in Victoria Arna or even if people are not they would know that women's dresses and the overall um, sort of uh, costumes and period dress looked a bit restrictive and uh, it's interesting I think the link between restrictive clothes and restricted thinking and we know that the age, at least in England, of the Victorian period was, at least on the surface, extremely prudish. Not only, of course, um, with women, but uh, men who perhaps were hypocritical some of the time in their attitude to um, risque viewpoints and risque behaviour. So she was very much involved in women's dress uh, reform and uh, as Debbie said, she um, did get involved in spiritualism at the age of 21 while she was leafleting, I think. Um, a, a woman, uh, can you remember her name now? I just read it. Uh, Theobald. Uh, I think it was Florence Theobald uh, who was a spiritualist. And uh, because of Florence Theobald, she did take part in science, sciences for quite a time although she later repudiated spiritualism altogether and said what we have, by we she meant her and uh, this gentleman Edward Maitland, who I need to say a bit about, uh, we, we are far, what we've got is far, far more than spiritualism, it's far, far more than theosophy for that matter. This isn't word for word, by the way, although I do have her, her the actual words that she couched this in somewhere in my initial uh, lecture which I gave to the Theosophical Society, I think it was in 2012. So we have this, um, this, this sort of nascent, nascent feminism uh, which uh, mushroomed or flowered as the suffragette movement gained momentum itself in the middle to later part of the, uh, later part of the 19th century in England. We have the women's dress reform, we have a tremendous love of animals which only really, I think, developed um, after she stopped fox hunting. It sounds a bit bizarre, but she was very keen on the hunt. But one day she saw the plight of the fox, which had been captured by the hounds, and became, across the board, a lover of um, animals, really. And um, partly because of that, and partly because of spiritual reasons, she um, wrote her first significant book, at least I think it was the first significant book in terms of uh, any kind of circulation, which was called The Perfect Way. And The Perfect Way is The Perfect Way in Diet. And The Perfect Way in Diet, I think again, was almost certainly ahead of her time, um, because it was on vegetarianism, which um, as we know today is getting more and more popular, uh, as indeed is veganism. But to my knowledge, in the 1870s, it certainly was not the usual kind of book you'd, you'd find and the usual kind of cookbook and so on. She also wrote something much more obscure called Health, Beauty and the Toilet. Uh, this um, it really geared up primarily to, to women. I must admit I haven't read that. Uh, but she was coming out with these quite um, provocative titles, I think, for that time. And uh, she was a bit precocious too, um, to say the least, because she wrote a, a book um, uh, on religion, which was originally a, a series of articles um, for the, I think it was called The Ladies Pictorial. And uh, this book was called Rosamunda. Uh, it was a set of articles and uh, someone encouraged her to produce it as a book. 
and I think you can see the way, at least uh, as this talk develops, you'll be able to see the way in which Anna developed her thought, even as early as 1875, which should only be about, what, 30 years of age then. I'll give a short quote from the book. This is Rosa Munder, which probably no one's ever heard of. Weak deities with beardless faces, mild and childlike, usurp the thrones of your giant goth and Norse forms so long have filled, where once the majestic form of Odin towered in huge divinity, now stands the feeble and lacerated feet of the pale Christ, where once we beheld a stately and fertile, fertile goddess, Hertha, there now kneels a slender, timorous maiden, with downcast eyes and wounded heart, a vestal unmated and sorrow-stricken. These are the new divinities, the rejected, the mean, the suffering, and to give these room grand and sturdy gods of the old faith are you and yours dethroned. So this was kind of like her look of um, ousting the old gods and bringing in the new, which to her was Christianity? Uh, her aim, um, my understanding of Anna is she wanted to, to have the ancient mysteries restored but under the banner of Christianity, but a Christianity which was uh, rejigged, she wouldn't use that word, reinterpreted along her particular mystic hermeneutic. Mm. Now, this hermeneutic actually came from Hermes, and of course the two words are linked. Um, but I, I say I'll, I'll go into a little bit more, obviously, in yeah. that in a moment. I just want to... I'm trying to sort of give a wider context. This woman is not far more uh, larger than just philosophy and spirituality. Um, I mean, there's a whole set of uh, qualities. Perhaps most of all, she became a doctor. Well, she was one of the first women to train for it, to be a doctor. Very much, yes. She? And she couldn't do it in this country. Yep. So she had to do it in Paris. Uh, um, uh, so th there's a lot of aspects to her, and given that she died in 41 and that she suffered from illness all her life, I think her achievements were uh, not a little. Mm. Uh, she also formed her own um, society called the Hermetic Society. This was partly in um, just opposition to the Theosophical Society, which she did become a member of. So I, I don't want to make this talk too disjointed because I feel I'm jumping about a tiny bit here. But as uh, she developed um, her various interests, uh, these interests, obviously, um, as we've seen through the, the, this quote that I made, she was interested in... Um, actually, Rose, yeah, Rosamund, uh, she wrote when she was 29, or at least it came out. It's not in print now. Uh, but she wrote a book in 1863, when she was only 23, called A Tale of the Early Christians, which also is not in print. Um, but then she got involved with, I think, someone, um, I was going to say, more significant than her husband, which is a little bit unfair. Uh, she married Algernon, who was at that time uh, Algernon... Uh, Kingsford, which was at that time it was a curate, and he he was probably as liberated as her, or perhaps she had no choice because she said, "I'll only marry you if I have an independent life and more or less do what I like." Uh, perhaps that's a bit unfair of me to say, put it that way, but this is exactly what she did. Uh, but um, she did the marriage to duty, if I may put it like that, and a child was born called Edith. And um, that that gave her a complete family. Although the impression I certainly get is that um, she could well have been the absent mother to Edith, and that, uh, she was well enough off. They were both well, particularly he, she. He was well enough off. To, I'm sure to have a nanny. So Edith would have been brought up with a nanny anyway, which was not unusual in middle class and upper middle class um, households in those days. So we can't feel that Edith was necessarily deprived um, on a maternal or at least a female 
front. But Anna was so busy giving lectures, giving talks, like in pamphlets, going to Switzerland. She did a lot of tours in Switzerland, a lot of talks in Switzerland, going all over the country, and basically wearing herself out, um, overriding her asthma as far as she could. Um, uh, one of the treatments for the, it's not really a treatment, but Jimson weed. She did um, use Jimson weed as and cl chloroform, I think, uh, and also towards the end of her life travels to Italy and elsewhere in the hope that the climate might help her uh, deteriorate in chest conditions. It did not, unfortunately. So goodness knows how much she would have produced if she'd lived to um, even the age I am. Uh, so uh, what we're getting, I'm trying to fill out a picture of her, of someone who, who's got married, had a child, um, is quite well off, has got a very determined will and someone called Alistair Crowley. Uh, now, a Alistair Crowley's perhaps leading idea out of all his ideas was the power of the will. We can also think about Nietzsche here. And um, Crowley commentated, uh, complimented her on one of the books that she wrote or on, or on herself in general. And I'll bring him in because I think out of all the sort of um, qualities which I think Anna has, and again, I would like to think I relate to them in a small way myself. The power of the will uh, maybe was her strongest and kept her going far longer in this in this world, I should say. Uh, and also, in every every activity, really, the power of the will was there. Uh, that's, I say that's just a personal view, but that's how my reading of her various um, biographers, and in fact, to date, I think there's only two main ones um, that are there. So we, we have this um, very um, contextualised picture of, of a woman who's political, who's uh, very much into health and nutrition, who, who, who's a poet. She later described herself as a prophet uh, and um, if, if that, and an author generally. Uh, but her main theme, I think, of this talk, and I think that's certainly the theme which I suspect Debbie wants me to uh, stress and I'm very happy to do that because I think that's the most important of her, of her work is is a spiritual really it's, it's a spiritual uh, rapprochement uh, between herself and Christianity um, uh, she did become a Roman Catholic quite early uh, although she resisted last rites there's a little bit of controversy about actually what happened so I'm not going to dwell on that let's dwell on her life but the rapprochement was really um, to get to understand Catholicism better, and indeed Anglicanism. She was only in her 20s, so like a, a number of us who have had very religious backgrounds, it's only fair on those religions to be looked at thoroughly, and she did. And the conclusion she came to, the two main conclusions, one was um, she didn't like the hierarchy of priestcraft, and the other one, she felt that the sort of um, Christianity that the priests peddled was far too materialistic. It was really turning spiritual truths and insights into icons, I'm sorry, idols, to be actually worshipped. So really the objects of religion actually became idols in themselves and a, a kind of materialistic approach to religion misplaced the ultimate spiritual metaphysic. Uh, so she was moving into this kind of thinking and of course this can be tracked by her various thoughts and publications which we have time to go into here because there's a certain length of time to be able to even say the titles um, but she met this man called Edward Maitland who also was uh, strongly religious biased he had a strong religious upbringing and his father wanted him to become a curate himself Instead of that, it was a great rebellious spirit, which I really like. He went off to California and became a gold miner. Uh, he didn't stay too long there, um, but I think he probably made a bit of money. We can check that, anyone wants to check Maitland. Uh, Maitland is always under the shadow of Anna, and I think that's wrong. I would recommend, if people are interested in reading Anna Kingsford, they should also read Edward Maitland. Uh, and indeed, it was Edward Maitland who, who wrote the... Um, first biography of Anna. Some people find it rather ponderous, but I mean, you know, he's Victorian. 
Um, I, I actually found it a substantial read, I can put it that way, but it's worth reading it if, you, if one is serious about knowing different aspects of Anna and perhaps discover there's anything he's, been, he's left out. So Edwin Maitland started writing books in his own right, uh, which I feel um, hardly anybody's ever read. Um, and they met, could have met, in the, uh, I've forgotten where they met now, um, but they met in 1874. They got in very well. He was 20 years older than her. And I would say that in many ways she was his muse. Um, he always talked her up very well, how beautiful she was and so on and so forth. This, I, I have to say, I don't feel comes out in her photographs at all. But then it, who, who's got the same idea as beauty as someone else? So um, what you get is a partnership. I would say this was basically an alchemical partnership. If you look at the alchemists of old, old uh, they were typically men, but they usually had a sister or a female friend, uh, or uh, another parallel up to a point would be John D and Edward Kelly. That's a slightly um, disturbing parallel, given that Edward Kelly uh, was a bit of a forger. Um, but I think his illuminations, which is Anna's word as well, um, some of them would have been true, and also certainly considered to be correct by many people today who follow the Enochian um, material. So we have this pair, so even though this talks about Anna, as I always remember that there's Edward in the background, and Edward um, uh, post-dated her, post-deceased her, so he was there all the time. Again, going back to her husband, uh, feeling myself that he was very enlightened, the husband didn't mind at all. Um, as far as we know, he didn't feel threatened by Edward, who would be older than him too, and assumed, I would assume correctly, that this was a platonic relationship. One never knows, but it doesn't matter to me, because what we're concerned about is the revitalization of Christianity under the Aegish of this couple, who had various, I'm going to stick with Anna's word, illuminations. And these illuminations occurred in dreams, they uh, came in trance, they came in hypnagog what we nowadays call hypnagogic, hypnopompic states, and um, the outcome of this were various writings which have been um, included in some volumes, but not all not all the stuff that came out has ever been published. Can I just start One was start? called Were they both doing the trance, or was it Anna doing the trance and Edward Maitland taking the notes and recording it? I've uh, never understood quite Got that. Well, the latter was correct, Debbie, but uh, I would say Edward had his own inner voice. Okay, right. Um, but the the primary work, certainly for publicity purpose, is always Anna. So you have Dream and Dream Stories, edited by Edward. You have Clothed of the Sun, be the illuminations of Anna Bonus, Kingsford edited by Maitland and of course you have the most famous book which I've yet to mention which isn't too bad after half an hour The Perfect Way or The Finding of Christ now this was in collaboration with Edwin Maitland I have the book here so if this was a proper YouTube thing you could see what I'm waving and this is the book and two or three chapters were either written by Maitland, not many people know this, or part of some of the chapters were written by him. It is not all Anna's work. We have to be unfair, I think, uh, where fairness is, is uh, appropriate. Um, so, the... Um, yeah, historically, you had the two meet, I think it was in the British Museum, it would be very nice if they did, but in any case, they went to the British Museum and they came out with more and more material, which only later, we are told by Maitland, they discovered it already existed. Now, to me, in some ways, that'd be a bit of a blow. I'd be very disappointed if I thought someone else had thought it before me. But apparently, what they were producing, which was stuff which already you could find the Greek mysteries, the Egyptian mysteries, Hermeticism, um, and some sorts of Buddhism and so on but they were very pleased indeed they actually felt that it confirmed 
their insights and I would have that isn't that continuing an old tradition yes but they didn't know it at the time mm. um so uh they had a friend called massey cc C. massey now i think this is the same massey who produced books of his own i think one called the egyptian genesis it, yes. uh, something like that uh, uh, or that might have been a different massey but anyway uh, this Massey was a member of the Theosophical Society and said, why, you know, why don't you guys join the Theosophical Society? So they did. And within a few months, um, Anna, there's a sense in which she took over, she said, let's, not, let's change the name and call it the London Lodge of the Theosophical Society. This was because she did, had some familiarity with Freemasonry and knew that the terminology in Freemasonry is of lodges. So again, not many know this, but um, uh, one contribution to theosophy was uh, the, the notion of lodge. You know, it's a verbal contribution there from Freemasonry. Uh, otherwise, I mean, she didn't she rather said rather unsavoury things about Freemasons uh, somewhere in Maitland's memories as she did about the Catholic Church, but that's, you can, one can look it up for themselves. But she liked yeah. their structure and she wanted to... She liked the structure, she liked the ritual, uh, and so on and so forth, and she felt theosophy needed a structure. And within, a, I think, just a few months, she, she was elected president of this particular lodge, remembering, of course, the Theosophical Society main uh, lodges, uh, we can use the, her word now, were in India and New York. Um, so she had the, the London Lodge, as it became called, uh, came to be called, uh, Anna had a, a number of differences with the Theosophical Society, despite the fact that it seemed that the Theosophical Society, particularly Madame, Madame Blavatsky being alive then, and some of her henchmen like um, Stennett, uh, what's his first name, Stennett? Arnold is it? Um, uh, Stennett, it Stennett? AP, Stennett, yeah. AP, probably Arnold, um, Stennett. Uh, th they seemed to have a similar approach to Anna in terms they received material. One of the big uh, criticisms of uh, them was that uh, Anna felt that they were also externalising things and not being totally inner. And there's a wonderful quote, which I'm, uh, it would take too long to try and find it here, where she said, I don't need your Mahatmas. I don't need this. I, you know, I can I get it myself. I don't. Having said that, though, she did have what she called her geniuses or her genius. And um, one of the main names for a genius was, of course, it would have to be Hermes. Now, another name for a genius was Mary. And I don't know if who this Mary would be. Um, likely more likely to be her middle name. Because, um, or middle names, because one of them, two of her middle names was actually Mary Magdalene, no less. So, and uh, yeah, and so it could have been Mary Magdalene, it could have been the Virgin Mary, it might have been just Mary. So, um, past slightly dubious criticism on the Mahatmas, as she had a secret teacher herself in the form of a genius, but whatever, uh, they didn't get on because partly there was a big row about Stinnett's, Sinnott's book on esoteric Buddhism. She said it's not esoteric and it's not Buddhist. So there are various differences, uh, there's lots of other differences, but the fallout from that was she gave up her presidency in 15 months. But they did remain in the Theosophical Society, in, I say they, Maitland as well, so even though they fell out, um, like myself, to date, uh, um, I have also have my own difference with the Theosophical Society, which I think I shall air on this podcast <laughs> any minute now, but I, I shall remain a member unless I get thrown out. I, I should say, yes, that now Anna Kingsford, I think one of the significances of this podcast, which I would write as the wider distribution as possible, and the YouTube along with it, with Anna, Anna, Anna Kingsford's photographs of her, pictures of her, whatever, maybe one or two animals maybe would be a good idea, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's up to Debbie. Um, the thing is, Anna Kingsford... Um, when I start getting more um, exploratory about her, not a single person in my circle had heard of her. And I do mix in esoteric circles. I, I mix in um, theosophic societies and no one had seemed to have heard of her. Um, um, I gave a talk on her, which was recorded, 
This was slightly unusual talk, because I spoke as if I was Anna, but I certainly didn't dress up in crinoline or anything like that. So I, I did speak as though I was Anna, and about two people had heard of her, and in fact, the two people had heard of her, I'd specifically invited um, from an order which, as far as I know, does not exist anymore, and I'm not going to name the order uh, for professional reasons. But um, apart from about two or three people, most of whom weren't theosophists, no one ever heard of her, uh, in 2012. Now, in 2018, the Theosoph Theosophical Society, a better late than never, actually gave a day school on Anna, and my suspicion and hope is, was, that Anna Kingsford is perhaps more well known in non-English um, jurisdictions than uh, she was, is over here. So they gave a day school on Anna, which, uh, two things, one, I was pretty disgusted that I wasn't asked to, to have a slot, Without sound, sound arrogant, I could have spoke the whole day on Anna, as I'm starting to do now. So I could have even given the day school myself, six hours. Um, but the other reason is, the very last talk, which was on Anna and esotericism, um, unfortunately the gentleman was going to give it was sick, I believe, so he couldn't give it. So um, I left. I mean, some of the, some of the talks were okay. Uh, one, one or two are very good indeed, but I, I think, as I say, um, the impression I got from one or two people, they weren't that interested in Anna, much more interested in presenting themselves. Again, no names here, of course. So, uh, not being asked to even give a slot, I very nearly resigned from the Theosophical Society. Um, I, I, in fairness to them, I don't know who organised that day. And it's possible they hadn't heard of me. It's possible they didn't know that I'd, I'd given a day. It's possible they didn't know that I'm actually um, a lecturer in es esoteric studies at various colleges. But whatever, I was pretty annoyed. I'm uh, not sure if there was a call for papers or not. There wasn't a call for papers, no, I don't okay. think, no. Oh, was there? No, there wasn't. There was on the next day school. The next mm. day school on the something to do with the Ockgoat. There was a call for papers. But it was the same weekend that I was a speaker elsewhere anyway so um, anyway I'm still a member at the moment yeah. uh, and um, the, the the esoteric side of Anna I think has to be the strongest side but it links in with everything else in particular links in with diet you see um, that's why perhaps her other book called The Perfect Way should also be read so um, I'm going to try and I'm going to have to refer to my original lecture which I gave at the Theosophical Society because some people are going to ask me or going to be interested in what was her method. Well I was going to ask you about that but I also wanted to quickly ask you why you find that I'll ask you this question. Her genius that she would speak to, so was that like a spiritual guide? No, no she didn't speak to him. He spoke to her. Her. So he came through, he wasn't like, you know like the masters in the Theosophy Society actually exist or would um, appear or speak to Blavatsky telepathically or something, I'm not, you know, all different ways. So, but she only spoke to this genius during her own trances. He, he's not... Uh, well, my understanding being. is that, that the genius came to her. Yeah. She wasn't invoking him. She wasn't doing a spiritualist medium thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I don't actually know enough about the Mahatmas to know how Blavatsky did it. I haven't taken sufficient interest, I'm afraid. Because okay. uh, they were living beings on this planet at the time. I was, that's what I was trying to see if there was a difference. Either was her genius a living being on this planet or it was... Oh, well, I'd say no in that case. I've got to be very right. careful with this cup of water here. Um, I, I would have said no. I don't I've, think she... Be, I, she didn't believe in those externalities, you see. I mean, the impression I got is that she wouldn't believe in Shambhala, she wouldn't believe in Tibet. I mean, oh, Tibet is a place, of course. Yes. And I like all that. Because um, to me, there's no need to externalise all this stuff. Um, I do... Yeah, it, it's one or two paragraphs here and there. Um, the This is going to be a little bit um, jumpy, as perhaps the whole of this talk has, in a way. Um, but the, the, the thing is, Anna says, we've got to get away from historicity. 
we have to get away from externals, historical characters in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, and look at Christ as the hidden man of the heart, the hidden person of the heart, who's been continually being born with, within us, crucified, ascending and glorified in the interior kingdom of the Christian's own spirit. Now, I wrote this about six or seven years ago, and uh, uh, reading this sentence now and talking to you, it seems to me it's easy for her. To, it's easier for her to say that, not easy, but easier her, for her to say that, that someone, to, that than someone who is not a Christian already. If one isn't a Christian, it seems to me that sentence is hard. Uh, for someone who is a Christian, of a fundamentalist nature, literalist nature, it's also hard. For someone who has leanings towards someone like particularly Swedenborg, who she had dreams about, Emanuel Swedenborg, then it makes much more sense. So she takes an awful lot for granted, actually. Um, I, I don't know if you, Debbie, want, want me to get onto any critical aspect of her or not. Um, but if you do, he, 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 it has been said that Anna was incredibly arrogant. And I, I think, um, whatever the case, she certainly makes a lot of assumptions. Because uh, um, she does look at Buddhism in her writings, in, in her perfect way. So she knows there's many, many people who are not Christians. But I don't think she really... She criticises Orthodox Christianity equally as she does agnosticism. And I think both, both sets of, of people are going to find that hard to take, what she says there. The, the concept of immanence, um, not imminent, imminence, but immanence, uh, because this is a very common viewpoint amongst esoteric Christians. Uh, and it's, it's a very common viewpoint about with Rosicrucians, particularly one of the Rosicrucian movements I looked at in the last few years, that you, you, Christ is already somehow there uh, as the, the divine spark that has been left over, as it were, from um, creation. Now, I don't think this is necessarily that easily swallowed, because one view is it means you have to do all the work yourself. Now she didn't. She didn't. I say she. She always was. A, I think she always considered herself a Christian. So that's a, that makes it slightly easier for. Her. I, I. I don't know if. I don't know if I'm explaining myself clearly, but I don't think Anna is easy for anybody, and I don't don't think she's easy for someone who is not a Christian and is searching for a way. If someone's searching for Christianity. The, the, the Christian way, I don't think Anna Kingsford is the first person they're going to, her interpretation, not the first person they're going to look at it, are they really? I don't think so. Well, her uh, understanding of, of the Christ, I took it as, was that it was an energy that was in all of us. Yes. To develop. Y yes. Y yeah, that's another way of putting it, certainly. Um, but uh, she says, however, that truth is... But beyond that, she says that truth is only accessible through illumination. So I may be a misunderstand her, but in some way, we all have to get illuminations. Now, I don't want to get too involved in this because it would take us off a, a, a long, a wrong track. But if she means illuminations through dreams, it's certainly not going to work for me because my dreams are not at all memorable. Neither do they take me anywhere. She does say one needs to be ardently aspiring to gain internal knowledge via prayer. Well, again, if you're a Christian, you may not like prayer. Devotion, yes. Meditation, yes. Maybe these all sort of things will help as well, I'm sure. Purity of thought and life. Purity in relationship to food. Well, again, not everybody wants to become a vegetarian. So she's very hard. I think she's a very hard taskmaster. And I should say that I gather that her husband never really took it on board. He 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 stayed more or less the same church of Anglican vicar all mm. his life. That's my understanding. And I think the day someone in that day school said that she he, he got rid of a lot of her stuff. I don't know about that. And they never even mentioned it. But whatever. Um, I think it's a hard route. And so let's. 
I'm just looking now. Because um, I wonder if her idea of intention is to be um, to ponder upon what Christ is and what He offers, and to try and draw it into oneself and to be act in a Christ-like way. To I'm not saying everything she would do, she would be like, oh, what did Jesus? Would, what would Jesus do for this? But but that kind of drive of so in answer to, to your question, Debbie, no, it's not just a simple matter of people seeing Christ as a role model and uh, acting accordingly. For better or for worse, it's much more complex. And I'm quoting from my original talk at the Theosophical Society, which in, in turn uh, is her words, because as I said, I was Anna Kingsford's talk. The doctrine, the doctrine we received, this is from her illuminations, mm -hmm. um, the doctrine we received is that all hermetic and Kabbalistic teaching from time immemorial uh, compared to alleged esoteric Buddhism, which is complementary at best, uh, relates to our, to our research. Our teachings are not derived from the Bible, the Church, spiritualism, or theosophy. It was only later did we actually discover Hermeticism. So they got all their teachings from these illuminations to begin with and then confirm them. Um, I don't take any drugs. Uh, I, it says we, we. We, of course, is her and Edward. We don't take any drugs apart from Jimson weed and chloroform for my asthma. That's her asthma. So I, I have to retranslate back to now me, not her. We don't use any hypnotism. We disclaim authority, dogma and tradition. Rather, I'll keep to the quoting, we contacted our inner geniuses. What um, Dion Fortune, I have to fall back on Dion Fortune here, there's another podcast, um, her inner guides, her inner plane guides. I mean, Dion Fortune, very influenced by Anna Kingsford. So we contacted our inner genius, inner genius and used entirely interior methods of recollection and this is a platonic thing, which we'll say a bit more about that later we relied on recollection, recollection of past earth lives as initiates of the sacred mysteries we would use intense concentration so as to relate to our permanent ego so that would be a capital E by a projection of the mind, I wish this was a YouTube now because my hand thing is important, by a projection of the mind and intuition going inward and upward, I would also add backward, but she's in eternity rather than time, sometimes known as transcendent, transcendental intro, intro vision. I say it's a bit of a mouthful, that will probably have to be played a few times for people to get it. Can you say them last two words again then? Transcendent Transcendental intro vision. Mm -hmm. So it's going, it's not just immanence, it is transcendental, but it's transcendental in an inner, inner sight, inner mode. That's how I understand it. That is then the guardian angel. Again, Crowley. I'm, I'm mentioning Crowley because Crowley was so complimentary toward Anna Kingsford and really was such a misogynist. Uh, Crowell, it's amazing that he compliments any woman at all, isn't it? Because he wouldn't have met her, would he? Yes, he did. Oh, he did meet. No, her. sorry, I beg your pardon. You met Dion Fortune. No, oh. he didn't meet Anna. No. Uh, she, yeah. Because I have a quote here from Alistair Crowley: "This woman did more in the religious world than that's any right. other person had done for generations." That's right. Yeah, that's my quote. Oh, that's his quote from his oh. book, a book on yoga. Um, the thing is, Crowley, the de the year that she died was the year, 1888 is it, that the, the uh, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn started. Yeah. And people, including Gilbert, um, the bookseller, you know, um, various people consider that Anna Sprengel, the mythical Anna Sprengel, was actually Anna Kingsford. Well, I was going to There's a whole connections that, there. Yes, I and yeah, I do see connections myself. Yeah, being the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, they were very influenced by her, weren't they? Her other works as well. Well, the thing is that the early founders and members, some of the early members of the Golden Dawn before the Golden Dawn ever existed, 
came to Anna's Hermetic Society. They even gave talks there. Mm-hmm. Mathers gave a talk on the mystical Kabbalah, you see. So, if you could say the Hermetic Society in some ways was a precursor of the Order of the Golden Dawn, particularly as both male and female were allowed in. It wasn't just a Masonic order, as we know, the Hermetic, the Golden Dawn. So, going back to this quote, um, the, the guardian angel is the genius of a person and it's a function of the person's own spiritual system. The genius c- connects him or her to his own divine informing spirit. This is the true inspiration. Other spirits are mere conversation. That's why I say she went off spiritualism in its normal sense, because these other spirits are just conversation, they're not the spirit she's talking about. They're not like trying to get you to your higher self, they're just about mundane things. I guess, yes. I've never been to a spiritual church, so I don't know what happens, but I, that's my stereotype. It's more um, or less mundane things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, divine communication divine communication is the spontaneous operation of the spirit in a soul made duly luminous and responsive via regeneration. So you have to have a regenerated soul with past lives, this is my understanding by the way, that you go back through and in her case she found she had various initiations in past lives and she could retrieve the gnosis of those initiations or the gnosis which was given to her subsequently on the initiations by recollection of soul memory. A book called Far Memory by the Egyptian, the woman wrote, was it H? Far Memory by... Never mind, it may come back. No. No. So, um, that's... Is it a bit more than this, though? Because it's still not fully clear to me, because I haven't done it. Um, But this is a quote. Her genius gave her a quote. And he said, or she said, hello, he... I don't know which genius it was, if it was Hermes, it's he, if it's Mary, it's a she. No, there is no enlightenment. This is the genius speaking now. And I don't think I gave this in my talk. No, there is no enlightenment from without. The secret of things is revealed from within. No one is a prophet unless he knows it. The instructor of a people is a man of many lives. Inborn knowledge and the perception of things... These are the sources of revelation. The soul of yourself instructs you. Having already learned by experience in the past, intuition is inborn experience, that which the soul knows of old and of former years. And illumination is the light of wisdom, whereby a person perceives heavenly secrets. Inspiration may indeed be mediumship, but it is conscious mediumship and the knowledge of the prophet instructs him. Um, Anna points out that she has, she doesn't have any occult faculties. She has no abnormal powers. She's not a natural clairvoyant. She's developed my gift through being 14 years as a vegetarian and having reminiscences of past lives, some of which I'm rather ashamed, one of which was a prostitute, she says. I have received Gnosis via my initiations, acquired in Greece, Egypt, India, England and France. My illuminations typically are accompanied by intense and breathless concentration. Now, this may be totally wrong, but I'm wondering if she was having asthma attacks or sometimes breathless, she used the word breathless, concentration. Did she actually receive some of her illuminations while she was having asthma mm. or in a dream state? That's just me saying that as an asthmatic. The gift was born with me. Apparently, I am an old spirit, an advanced ego, capital E, E, having such a thirst for life and for being, I pushed myself to a point of spiritual evolution, someone in advance of the rest of my race. Mm. But such a faculty will in time be attainable to everybody who has been really initiated into a former birth. I wrote to I wrote to Madame Bavatsky saying I'm no medium, I don't have medium mediumistic powers, I don't produce rapping, I don't produce writing, I don't produce signs. Spiritualism is grotesque. Our work, her and Edward's 
lays far beyond it. In terms of the spiritual revival of this age, in terms of the spiritual revival of this age, spiritualism represents merely the phenomenal and personal. Your theosophy represents the philosophical and occult. Our work, on the other hand, represents the truly mystical and divine. <laughs> so you can see why some people consider she was arrogant. And also um, why Blavatsky, didn't Blavatsky say she was um, the most natural mystic she'd ever met? Yeah, she says some, she says some less complimentary things about her too. God, she says she dressed like a zebra sometimes. Mm. Yeah, it, it's all in pert. <laughs> this is the one. To, oops, it's upside. This is this is the one I mentioned last time. This is mm. the one. I go on with her. To be clear, then, gnosis is required by initiation into a previous birth. Uh, but the gnosis was revived, to my perception, via psychic reminiscence. Read Plato's Mino. Uh, and you will get a good uh, articulation of this method also used by other Greek philosophers Plato's Mino, psychic reminiscence of the soul memory my intuition then operates under spiritual illumination and is a perceptive and recollective faculty from experience of, of the soul over the ages, uh, over the lives I'm not speaking of ordinary memory it is the soul that has the ability to recover in a later incarnation, memories of what impinged in a previous in incarnation by the permanent ego, uh, capital E. And from 1882 onwards, Christmas Day, I had an illumination which encouraged me to uh, in identify first and foremost as a poet. That's my main identity. For poets are children of the sun, and I have as it were, being clothed with the sun, and thus illuminate, which has illuminated me times without number. For the personality of the poet is divine, um, and being divine have no limits. Um, so what can you say? Yes. And so um, what does she mean by being clothed with the sun? Ah, I can tell you. Well, she can tell, she can tell, tell us. Um, it's in the Bible, it's in Revelation. That's right, yeah, Revelation. Uh, where is it? Here it is. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Alistair Crowley also quotes from Revelation, but a different woman. A woman clothed the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Th this is the soul and her full illumination by the spirit for woman denotes the soul and then intuition uh, uh, Anna Kingsford is a poet and poets are children of the sun the sun is illuminating them and the, the sun is the soul fully illuminated by spirit then having full perception of the divine truth and it is needed for a woman to be its revealer because the woman is the soul and intuition whereas Maitland is the intellect uh, you see there's a complementarity between the two of them so she's seeing herself as the woman clothed in the sun as yes. what's said in revelations yes well I mean no I mean not not actually in revelation but she's using that as a me nothing's literal you see with Anna it's a comparison it's a simile it's a metaphor for this poetic intuition mm -hmm. she's not literally um, in revelation because for her there's nothing literal in the new testament anyway <laughs> none of it's literal but it's something that she would be attaining to out of all the women in the book of revelation that would be the woman that would be what she would want to be or is she is becoming that or has been well, well there's a, um, it's a she's compa it's a comparison to draw out her hermeneutic mm. I mean, she certainly wouldn't want to be Babylon. No, that's it. That's what I mean. That's the woman she's attaining to be. Uh, yeah. Well, she, this is her gift. Mm -hmm. She has the gift of that quality. Yeah. I don't think she's reaching for it. She is. Her she being, is. Her being okay. is, is this, really. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, and, and I say that's the one which really caught my imagination. Um, and then Maitland wrote the book about her and he 
uh, used that as the title, didn't he? Um, no. Uh, not exactly, no, it's a collection. He edited a book. Oh, did he? Yeah, he, he edited the Illuminations, it's an edited, I mean, you, uh, you would have written a paragraph, I mean, an uh, introduction. Uh, introduction. But The Cloak with the Sun is not about her, it's her Illuminations. Um, it's available yes, somewhere. Yes, and you um, can get it for PDFs to download. Um, I should add, in terms of her hermeticism, um, this is the end of my talk. Uh, oh, that's not it. Because hermeticism uh, was very important to us, fortunately, to society about after it. She work. actually translated a major part of the hermeticism known as the Virgin of the World. Um, there's a wonderful introductory essay, which I actually think is by Edward Maitland, not her. But anyway, 1885, she, I've, got, I've got it here, or most of it, The Virgin of the World, uh, which is part of the Hermetica. Um, and um, in, in 1887, on her deathbed, she's still writing her diary, she said, I've had ten years of revelations, ten years. I've now discovered the divine system of the Theosopher, which I realise now to be identical with the Hermetic science, the tenets of the Kabbalah, the tenets of alchemy, an oriental religion. Enlightened by this inner light, I perceive the fallacy and the idolatry of proper popular Christianity. I'm not therefore a Christian at all, in the sense that one of my reverent brothers is, you know, one of her older brothers was a strong Christian, I'm not a believer. I don't believe in incarn in I don't believe in incarnation, etc., etc. I die therefore a hermeticist, believing in the spiritual gods with whom I indeed aver I have conversed with. I've seen face to face. I believe in the evolution of the soul from the lowest grade, on the lowest rung on Jacob's ladder, unto the presence of the Holy One, and in the solid solidarity and brotherhood of all creatures, particular guinea pigs. And so that all may come at length to eternal life, which is on the upward path. So, um, I mean, it's inspiring stuff, I, I think. But she says she owes a lot. Also, her sources, uh, uh, we need to say something about her sources. Yes, that's great. That's great. Um, her background is Jakob Burma, or Jakob Burm, the little shoemaker of Germany, who was um, essentially excommunicated, treated terribly by the local church. Um, uh, Jakob Burma. Um, he in turn influenced Emanuel Swedenborg and she had dreams about Swedenborg and she said well Swedenborg wasn't bad but he got something wrong. Um, he wasn't quite right, he was quite good but he, he didn't believe in re reincarnation so he must have been wrong and I'm not sure he was a, a vegetarian in which case he, that's me, I wasn't sure he was a vegetarian so, well, he wouldn't uh, have believed in reincarnation because he believed everyone went on to the yeah, he didn't believe next in reincarnation, no, realm, didn't he? And he no. went and visited people in the next world. She had this dream that he, he she was in his library and there's this venerable old man and they had a conversation and so on and so forth. No. Um, so she, she, she sees herself partly as the apogee of that current, if you like, uh, um, but she's also influenced, influenced by the abbot. Uh, Abbot, Abbot Trithemius, um, uh, the Despectum Secundis, printed in 1567, she said, I found, I found the Abbot's writing, the Abbot's writing heartening in the extreme, because the Abbot writes about tinctures, you see, the seven spirits of God, the Selo Elohim, seven very important, of course, um, and Zeus, Apollo, Hermes, and all the rest of them, the classical gods, with their Hebrew and Eastern equivalents, are celestial personalities appointed to represent us, mortals, uh, and potenci potencies of these, spirit, these seven spirits. This is the true meaning of mythology. Now wait for it. Only when man and woman is built up of all the gods is the ascent of the ladder of regeneration, from circum circumference to centre complete. So my understanding of that is saying we need to have the qualities of all the classical gods integrated in one point, 
you call that the Christ point if you like, mm -hmm. and then we will, we will know regeneration. Um, uh, so it's an interesting way of looking at the mythologies, of course other people look at that way too in some ways. Um, so she was convalescing in France when she received this book by the abbot and she then starts talking about her tinctures. Uh, her main one is red, hence the title of Alan Pert's book, uh, Red Cactus. Uh, Edwards uh, is mainly violet. Um, so obviously she's not coming from a place which is all original. Um, but I think it is interesting that she got so much stuff before she really started her research in the British Museum. That is interesting. Because she couldn't have got that from a Christian background because it was far too conventional. So where did it come from? And when you say tinctures, what do you mean by what colours that she saw in auras or round her? I don't know what she means. Oh, right, OK. That's fine. I, don't, I don't know what she no, means. No, I don't know what she means either. Half the time, <laughs> I don't know what she's on about. Well, um, it's quite difficult to read, but you have to really ponder what she's, you know... Yes, thinking. it's almost as bad as Alice Bailey. Don't ask me to do a podcast on no, her. I'm not a fan of Alice Bailey. I went to a conference of hers on only Saturday. I'm broad church, you know, I'm very broad church. Um, she also had a, 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 the correct interpretation of the creed. I don't know if you knew this. She said the creed is all wrong, this is the correct interpretation. And it was published eventually by, uh, published in 1916, called the Creed of Christendom. She says something about that in her, her... I think the problem with is that I think there's a difference between certainty and being arrogant. If you're certain, you're bound to sound dogmatic, bound to sound arrogant, I think. Mm. It's a, a thin line, I, I, I think, between the two. I wonder if that makes her, when she used to go, to say, let's say, to the Theosophical Society meetings, maybe she wasn't very good debating things with people then. Um, it appears she, she was a very good orator, but debate's different, isn't it? Yes, uh, debate is different to oratory. Yes, maybe she wasn't open for that, I don't know. Um, and she may have had some insecurity which made her defensive uh, uh, about these key points. Um, but also she would have had all this when she was very young, wouldn't she? Because she was quite young compared to, you know, Madame she, Blavatsky. Yeah, yes, yeah. She has been compared by her friend, Lady Caithness, to Hypatia. Ah. Um, her favourite divinity, she wrote hymns, I've got them in the lobby actually, not, not in here. I've, she wrote various hymns to the um, classical gods and goddesses, marvellous stuff. Oh, wow. But her favourite goddess was Pallas Athena, the goddess of wisdom. So she was so sure. I think that's another reason why I like her. Not that I'm sure in myself. But I like someone who is, because I think nowadays it's very hard to find someone who is showing themselves at all, <laughs> you, you know, particularly in politics. Um, bring that in. Um, she wanted to lift the veil of illusion on Orthodox Christianity, suffers from a veil of illusion. She wants to open the key to all the sacred scriptures and she thinks she's got the key. They've got the key that can open up all the sacred scriptures, not just the Upanishads, you know, the Bible, it was all over. So it would be for her understanding or to give to everybody? Oh no, to give to everyone. They wanted to form an esoteric church. Mm. Oh no, they wanted to give to everybody, they had it. I didn't know they wanted to form an esoteric yes, church. Yes, they did, yes. Oh, can you tell us some more about that? Uh, well, no, well they, no, they didn't. They weren't successful. They never did. And when you say that, that's her and Edward mate. Yes, yeah. and Edward did start something on his own, but it didn't last very long, it wasn't very successful. We hoped that this would lead to a new esoteric church. We wanted to get known. The truth we had was so far in advance of anything the disciples, that's the disciples of HPB, and her gurus possess. So we set up the Hermetic Society, had three sets of lectures. Um, yeah, so this total confidence Mm. It's wonderful. Um, in 1980, in 1884, I started my own hermetic society, which does not depend on Mahatma, Mahatmas, does not boast of any miracle workers, does not seek the cultivation of abnormal powers. Its aim was to promote the comparative study of the philosophical and religious systems of the East and West, particularly the Greek and mysteries and the hermetic gnosis, 
and its allied schools, the Kabbalistic, Pythagorean, Platonic and then Alexandrian, these being inclusive of Christianity, with a view to the elucidation of their original esoteric and real doctrine and the adaptation of its expression to modern requirements. So, I mean, it's, the confidence is fantastic. Yes. You know, there's no own doubt. Once you have this inner voice, you don't have any doubts. And I don't think Steiner did either. You see, that's why I put all these people together. Swedenborg, Steiner, Kingsford, and of course Blavatsky herself. Um, you, you know, they're all of a, of a leaf of the same book, in a way. Yes, a certain level that I only dream of attaining. <laughs> But you see, I've been brought up with certainty too, but it's in what what people would, uh, perhaps loosely call the exoteric certainty. But as you know, I have problems with the, the division, really. Uh, but I, I've been brought up with certainty too. Um, but through my parents, I mean, and through their... And when I go to a certain Christian church at the moment, which I went uh, last um, last week... It, it, not here, not in London, but elsewhere. Again, there's certainty, and they asked me why. Why do you come here? And I said, well, you've got certainty about what you don't believe, and it's the same certainty that I have that I what I don't believe. That's very good, you see. <laughs> but I mean, unfortunately, it's not in London. It's not in Eastbourne either. It's a great shame. Well, they do exist. They do exist in both, um, or exist all over. But to me, I think if you have certainty. It's good to share it, which they wanted to do. That's why they wanted to have a church. If you have certainty on your own, you might finish up in a mental hospital. Yes, because you've got no It's a religious delusion. It. Religious yes, delusion, you right. see. Yes, and this is why people suffer from the Messiah effect and all kinds of things like that. But she obviously had Maitland to help her with what she was doing. and they were both She always had that support, because she yes. wouldn't get support from her husband, that's for sure. Not mm. See, Baron Spedaleri who was the literary heir to Eliphas, Eliphas Levi, no less, he actually said, you are the new Messiah. Even Levi would be astonished at your teachings. <laughs> Nothing written by any previous Christian mystic, including Swedenborg, is comparable to your writings. The splendor of the Kabbalah has been surpassed. With praise like that, was well, fantastic, a man fans having praise like that. It's one who didn't go to her head. No one it didn't go to her head, because of course Swedenborg never did want to um, start a new church, did he? he never did. No, because he was saying that it was a new age where we don't need a church, wasn't he? Yeah, or the whole world is a church. Yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah. and that we can all come to God ourselves. This is apart from a review. Um, she started experiencing these visions in 1875. See, if she took Jimson weed. And chloroform, that would give you visions, wouldn't it? If you were taking a lot of it, I would think. See, that would give it. So probably she had far more than... Um, I mean, I think Steiner and I think Pat Mayton had an inner, inner sight, but they didn't get they it didn't from... They didn't need to take drugs to no. take it, did they? But and she had it particularly when she said she was breathless. So say, this is speculative, she was having an asthma episode. She took some Jimson weed to calm it down. And she was concentrated breathlessness. I think asthma is a real key to, to her thinking, not to her thinking, but to the fact she was open to visions. That's, the content of the visions is a different matter. Hmm. Um, but the treatment for asthma nowadays is different. What a shame. So maybe, <laughs> so maybe when she was, we were saying about Steiner, for example, he was, um, didn't need to take drugs for it. He was kind of natural. Yes. He worked on yes. himself where she needed a little step up to get to there. But when she got there, she was still on the same kind of page as he was. She was yes. It wasn't a hallucination. No. This helped her get to where she was supposed to be, to open up them higher faculties, I suppose I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, she met Maitland around the same time, and what they wanted to do was to give a new interpretation of the Bible based on the principles and methodology of Renaissance Hermeticism. Uh, so they had that aim, I suppose, quite early on. And her, reminisc the, her reminiscences were based on previous initiations into the sacred mysteries. So is that like looking at past lives? 
Essentially, yes, y yes. Uh, I mean, uh, I think she had. I mean, I think the whole reincarnation thing. Many people think they've had very really famous past lives, and often don't have lowly. But she, she had both. She hints that she had very low past life, in terms of status, like um, a prostitute. But she also, I think, she felt she was Joan of Arc, which I find a bit off-putting. Mm. Uh, it, it's some of the examples are given by Pert. He didn't like them either. But I think she had a, must have had a lot, which were never named. And Pert uh, is the one that wrote the biography Red Cactus. Well, this is the one that I, I was found very satisfactory. It's very easy to read. I mean, it's not like Maitland, not like reading Maitland. See. I felt there's something wrong with the world for very early on in life. Well, I think if you ask Maddie, you do. Uh, although she says it's not just because it's not just because I was always in delicate health, particularly with asthma. I felt women had a poor deal, they did. I, I, and I was a feminist as early as my teens. I was concerned about the way women dressed, using corsets, crinolines, tight shoes, hair high heels, and stays. So I joined the rational dress movement. Um, let give me a quote. Now I think this. I think she was a jolly good pagan, and why I say this is what she says here. The doctrine of interpretation is of nature's hieroglyphs. These are written for us in the sky, in the sea, and the land. They are pictured for us in the glorious pageantry of night and day, sunset and dawn. They are woven into the many-coloured warp and woof of flower, seed and rock, of vegetable and animal selves, of crystal and dewdrops, and of all the mighty phenomena of planetary cycles, solar systems and starry revolutions. And that's pure paganism to me. It is, yes, because she's been at one with nature. She's got oh, a lot. Yes. <laughs> she says, always walking bare feet, you know, walking bare feet. And there's a great quote. Let's see if I can find it here. Which is, um, yeah, if you're on the grass, must walk in bare feet. Um, yes. he, he, now, if you want to become a man of power, you must be a master of fire. The man who seeks to be a hierophant mustn't dwell in cities. He may begin his initiation in a city, but he can't complete it there, for he must not breathe the dead and burnt air pollution. Mm -hmm. In a city you respire air upon which the flame has passed. You breathe fire and it consumes you your blood. The man who seeks all power must be a wanderer, a dweller in the plain and the garden, and in the mountain. He must seek the sun and the breath of night. He must commune with the moon and maintain direct contact with the great electron electric currents of the unburnt air and with the unpaved grass on the earth of the planet. It is in the unfrequented places, in lands such as that of the East, where the abominations of Babylon are unknown, and where the magnetic chain between earth and heaven is strong, that the man who seeks power and would achieve the great work must accomplish his initiation. So it's incredible stuff. Yes, it's absolutely it incredible stuff. But people... Do look into this kind of thing, not just the under kingsbits of this world, but people that do look at esoteric or religious or look more deeply into it, not just those that go to church. We do have an affinity with nature though, don't we? We do feel oh, yes. it's important. Yes. You know, we know it's so. God's creation just as much as we are God's creation. Um so uh yeah she she said she tried to harmonise with Mr Sinnott and she failed. Um, it's sufficient to say that Edwin and I do wish to remain independent of the society, but we'll keep our mem. We'll keep it's been difficult to do so. And that's why they had the Hermetic Society. Yes. Uh, um, she had a big. Tr she says, "I won't bore you with, the, with this controversy, but it was very much to do with his book, um, Sinnott's book." But um, Theosophy was trying to be very. Um, Indian and Eastern, wasn't it? Yes. Where she, like Steinem, was trying to bring more of a a Christ feeling towards it. Yes, she's standing. much more Christian hermeticism, yes. which again, I, that's the reason why I like it. And I think that's one of the problems that Theosophy had in the early days, was that some people wanted to stick to the Christian 
mysteries yeah. and not just the Indian or the Eastern. Yeah. I mean, she says she's convalescing in Rome. Uh, by November 1886, in your terms, I was dying. Initially, I caught a cold, yeah. Led to pneumonia, yeah. Which made the TB I already had much worse. I don't want to dwell in those days, but I'll tell you that on, on 6th of June 1887, while in Florence, I reflected on my stay in Rome and remember that a great horror and contempt for the degraded cult of Christianity seized me. The priest resembled black flies buzzing around the putrid corpse of a dead religion. Oh, it still is a bit like that, isn't it? <laughs> well, I've never been to Rome, but um, it could well be. It's very visual, isn't it? But also her getting um, out around the uh, Europe to see what was going on elsewhere. Yes, yeah, um, France, more. Switzerland, uh, Italy. And she would do these travels with Edward Maitland, wouldn't she? Oh, she always had someone to help her. Sometimes it was her mother. Her husband, Ed Edward, was the main companion, though. Because right. her mother died later. Her mother died a month later. Oh. In March. Because she died quite young in her... 41. Yeah. Um, I mean, there is stuff, you see, there's stuff which isn't available in the British editions of her work. So I would like, perhaps we should be rounding up soon, but I would like yeah, to we'll just... To round up soon. I would like to quote from something which isn't available. It's only available in the American edition of The, um, the Perfect Way. Uh, and I'll read it out. It's a preface to the American edition of The Perfect Way, okay. 1885. Edward has pointed out that this, this gnosis, which we're discovering, while in the world, has never prior to the publication of our book really been given to the world or presented under a form which would render it understandable by the world. This gnosis has only been reserved for initiates pledged to secrecy and concealed under symbols uh, to the interpretation of which they alone had the key, but now this key has been lost uh, and so carefully concealed as to be no longer available, not even for the initiates themselves. And because only by a new illumination can it be restored that such a revelation, capital R, as represented by our book, becomes a necessity. You know, she really wanted it out there. Really wanted it out there. Our book's mission, she wrote this in the spiritualist magazine Light, our book's mission is simply of rehabilitation and interpretation, undertaken with a view not to supersede Christianity, but to save Christianity from itself. The perfect way seeks to consolidate truth in one complete whole and to demonstrate its uni universality. It seeks to make peace between science and faith, to marry the intellect and the intuition, to bring together East and West and to unite Buddhism with Buddhist philosophy with Christian love via a spiritual base. Can't get much more ambitious yeah, than that. That's right. See, I like her ambition. <laughs> the ambition is fantastic. No wonder she burnt out and, and burnt herself out. I think bringing the East and the West together is very important. Um, I, I'm from the Gurdjieff tradition, as many people know, and one of his was about, you know, we have to bring the East and West together and unite them. The, and I felt the beginning of the Theosophy Society, the heads of the Theosophy Society at the time, didn't want to do that. They want to keep it all separate. The East That's the impression I get. Yes, I get that impression as well. But for the world to get on and to learn, because both sides, the East and the West, have different um, pieces of the puzzle, let's say, and we need yes. to put the puzzle together so that we can grow together and evolve. Sometimes I think that the truths and knowledges we hold are so high and so deep that the age can't receive them, don't understand them that all we shall be permitted to do is formulate them in some book so as we can leave a legacy to the world once we've gone. Um, the truth we have is far in advance of the disciples of Madame Blavatsky. They're far in advance of the Buddhists or the Masons. 
they only know the lower triangle of the seal of Solomon. Um, this lower triangle is the masons always rebuilding, always having to rebuild it. But what has been expounded to us is the secret of the upper triangle, the city not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, which I would say that's the, the new Jerusalem, I would say, you see. The divine coming down. Um, we to reach up to it. Yeah, I mean, that was a letter she wrote to Lady Kate Ness. Um... Uh, yeah. so to bring this to a close because we've been talking for quite a while <laughs> even longer than <laughs> yeah, last time we need to do a, a maybe you need to do a day full of Anna Kingsford works um, what would you so, recommend for anybody that was new to Anna Kingsford to start with one of her books or perhaps a biography about her can I just give a concluding sentence yes go for it which is written by Maitland which is quite appropriate I think in a way um the Perfect Way is a remarkable book, whether one accepts its ideas or not. Dr. Kingsford's theory of life, in brief outline, is that life is a series of reincarnations, by means of which the soul acquires its experiences, that the deeds and aspirations of one life predetermine entirely the quality of the next life. Well, I would say by that view, she won't come back. I would have said she, but he claimed she, well he claimed, Maitland claimed, this is worth just saying that before we stop, Maitland claimed that he did receive messages from her later on, which isn't the same as being another life of course, but uh, uh, he did claim that she received um, messages and uh, she met Swedenborg in, the, in wherever they went and so on and so forth, so it was rather interesting. So, sorry Debbie, I mean, you you asking me the best source? Well. I, I mean, I don't think you go wrong with Pert until someone writes another. I mean, I've got some vague idea. No, one of the speakers at the day school was writing an, uh, another book on Annie Besant or had written a new biography of Annie Besant. I, I think I got slightly mixed up and hoping maybe it was wish fulfillment and someone's going to write another biography of Pert because people seem to criticise Pert. But in that case, why don't they go beyond him? So until someone goes beyond Pert, I mean, if you're a bit short of time and you can't get involved in Maitland's ponderous prose, then um, uh, this is very good. But my, I think Pert, I mean, Pert's criticism, in fact, isn't so much of Anna. It's a criticism of Maitland at the back, one of his appendices or more. And I think, strangely, that Pert... This is purely speculative, and I, I don't want to speak ill of the dead because I think Pert's passed away himself. But I think Pert was actually jealous of Maitland over Anna because I think it's easy to fall in love with Anna. I, I almost fell in love with her, uh, you know, and I think Pert, to write a book like this, he must have been in love <laughs> with her as well. Now, the difference is that Maitland was writing from knowing Anna, Anna over years, and he was, he was in love with her as well, you know, we all fall in love with Anna. Um, so... My reservation about Pert's book is that he was a bit jealous, jealous of Maitland. I mean, that's just a, a speculation, but you can, one can read it for themselves and see what they think. But then you can't really see how he's jealous unless you read Maitland as well. And I don't actually recommend Maitland unless you're laid up for a few months. You know, if you're laid up for a few months, you've got nothing else to do and you hate TV, you may as well read Maitland. But he's not, and it's very hard to get, although you can get, you can read it as PDF, yeah. But me personally, I don't like reading stuff off a screen, so I'd rather have the book. And um, I think you can get it about £100 off um, Amazon, and maybe £120, something like that. Well, someone has to be very dedicated if they want to spend uh, and, and that. And Pert, I mean, Alan was very kind and sent me a copy from Sydney, I think, um, personally, privately. Although it's not handwritten, it's not written, it's not signed. But um, I don't know how much it costs, but it'd be cheap. It'd be cheaper, you know. I think Pert is all one needs, really. Because some people will just be interested in her for her biography, whereas others might be more wanting to obviously open up themselves to what she was doing herself and try to emanate her or to find their higher selves. Well, um, they, I have a personal problem, and I know this is going out to who goodness knows who 
I have a personal problem with Anna because I don't believe in reincarnation at all. Um, I, I have no need to believe it. Uh, I, 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 I just don't have beliefs really in that way. So, uh, and I wouldn't want to emulate, emulate Anna because I've got my own um, approach to being, being in the world, which possibly could form a podcast, but I'm a little bit uneasy about it being a podcast because it's the next, it's how we finished last time, it's the day school and personal myth. I think if your personal myth needs a belief in reincarnation, good. At the moment, mine doesn't at all, and I, I suspect it never will. So, and in any case, as I wouldn't want to emulate Anna, it was very, very difficult for me to even try to be her six years ago or whenever it was. I mean, that wore me out, I can tell you. And I'd said I'd never do it again, and I never have. But one would still find her writings interesting, even if one did, oh, absolutely. did not like reincarnation. It wouldn't, it's not important to have to believe in that. To oh, no, her no. Her methodology, you see, The Perfect Way is a difficult book. But it's really, it's her methodology. The, my interest in The Perfect Way was hermeneutics, not hermetics, hermeneutics. And her hermeneutics here are interesting and the clue to her thinking is in her methodology. To me, yeah, it's, it's totally irrelevant if she got it via personal reminiscence or not, or belief in reincarnation or not, because her methodology is here and elsewhere, in all her writings, her methodology is more or less the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, to oversimplify, she metaphor, and there's no such word, she metaphor, metaphoricizes everything. Everything is metaphor, should have said this long before. Everything's allegory, metaphor, similar. And to, again, we haven't done criticisms of Anna, and maybe we shouldn't, but to me, that's too extreme. It's almost like there's no historical content to the Bible at all, or at least not to the New Testament. And that, to me, it, it has its own limitations. And that's where I think, uh, if you like, she does make the case for the word esoteric, because there's no exoteric left. Because she hates priestcraft, I can understand that, I'm not keen on it myself. You know, the priestcraft, the, so even though she likes the hierarchy in one sense, she despises it in another. Because if you find the Christ in you, why is there a need for an external guru? Why is there a need for a priest, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I don't really want to do an accounting system, but if I had to do an accounting system, there's much more I like of Anna than I dislike. And your course in the autumn, how, if someone was interested in coming on that, what's the title of the course and where would they apply? Well, it's personal mythologising and that's not the full title, I can't remember the second part, but personal mythologising is sufficient, and it's the Mary Ward Centre, and it's in September. Well, thank you very much, Ken. It's been a pleasure as always, and I look forward to next time. Thank you very much, Debbie.